Anthropologist Hermann Schaffhausen once wrote that, in the most ancient human crania, the occipital was the most developed and the frontal region the least developed, and the increase in the elevation of the latter marked the transition from barbarous to civilized man. The Omo II skull, discovered in Ethiopia, and the Solo skulls from Java represent significant findings in the study of human evolution. Omo II, questionably dated to 233,000 years ago, exhibits a mix of archaic and modern human features, but the exact age is still being debated. Originally suggested to be closer to Homo erectus, this skull now is considered an archaic Homo sapiens. Half a world away, the Solo skulls from Java, Indonesia, conventionally classified as Homo erectus soloensis, are believed to be between 117,000 to 108,000 years old. However, this classification was used simply due to a lack of other appropriate species, and so the skulls were lumped into Homo erectus, as were every fossil in Asia that was not a Homo sapiens at the time they were discovered. Comparative analyses reveal notable similarities between Omo II and the Solo skulls. Both display pronounced brow ridges and a low cranial vault, characteristics typical of Homo erectus. Additionally, the occipital region of Omo II is angled, a feature observed in the Solo specimens. These shared traits suggest that Omo II retains several archaic features reminiscent of Homo erectus. Nonetheless, Omo II also presents features aligning it with anatomically modern humans, such as a more rounded cranial shape and reduced facial prognathism. This combination indicates that Omo II of May represent a transitional form, bridging earlier Homo erectus populations and later Homo sapiens. Omo II also appears very close to the Ingaloba 18 fossil skull of an early Homo sapiens that was discovered in Laitoli, Tanzania dated to around 120,000 years. The Omo II skull represents one of the earliest known fossils of Homo sapiens. This cranium displays a fascinating mosaic of archaic and modern human features. On the other side of the world, the Solo skulls are said to bear the hallmark traits of late Homo erectus populations. While still retaining traits reminiscent of archaic human populations, Omo II foreshadows the emergence of fully modern human anatomy. This evolutionary snapshot aligns with the broader narrative of early Homo sapiens venturing into new territories, armed with increasing cognitive sophistication and technological advancements. Early Homo sapiens may have ventured into new territories repeatedly, encountering and sometimes interbreeding with archaic populations. However, the archaeological record also hints at periods of conflict and replacement, as modern humans outcompeted and replaced their archaic counterparts. There is little doubt that, had the 14 Solo skulls had been located in Africa, they would be classified as early Homo sapiens and would be one of the most important fossil discoveries of all time. But since they were discovered in Asia, their importance has long been overlooked and dismissed. The resemblances between the Omo II and Solo skulls highlight the complex evolutionary relationships among hominin species during the Middle Pleistocene, suggesting an early out-of-Africa event or gene flow from Asia to Africa. Were these skulls part of the same population, examples of convergent evolution, or the product of gene flow between Africa and Asia? The possibility of a connection between these two significant finds has intrigued anthropologists, especially in light of evidence suggesting an early out-of-Africa migration around 120,000 years ago during the Eemian interglacial period. This migration, potentially bringing early modern humans into Southeast Asia, raises highly compelling questions about interspecies interactions, including the role of the Solo River site in this dynamic. The Eemian period, marked by warm climates and rising sea levels, provided favorable conditions for human dispersal. Fossil and genetic evidence suggest that Homo sapiens began expanding out of Africa much earlier than previously thought, long before the major dispersal events around 60,000 years ago. The Omo II and Ngaloba 18 skulls offers a crucial window into this process. Their blend of modern and archaic features, including a rounded cranial vault combined with a pronounced brow ridge, points to a transitional phase in human evolution.
For most of human history, Java was connected to Southeast Asia during the last two million years due to colder temperatures and lower sea levels, with our current period and the Eemian period being among the two exceptions. By 125,000 years ago, the climate became much wetter, and rising sea levels made Java an island again, and allowing for the expansion of tropical rainforests. The Solo Skulls, discovered along the banks of the Solo River in central Java, have long puzzled researchers. These fossils, attributed to late Homo erectus, are the youngest examples of this species and exhibit a mix of robust features, including thick cranial walls, pronounced brow ridges, and low cranial vaults. However, their classification as Homo erectus is being increasingly questioned. The Solo skull is oval-shaped from above, with thick brows, inflated cheekbones, and a prominent bone bar wrapping around the back. The brain volume was quite large, ranging from 1,013 to 1,251 cubic centimetres, which is at the lower range for modern humans. One possibly female specimen may have stood 158 centimetres, around 5 feet 2 inches, tall, and a body mass 51 kilograms, around 112 pounds. But males were likely much larger than females. The Solo River site's context suggests a remarkable story, a collection of skulls, seemingly isolated from any post-cranial remains, that has led to speculation about their origins and purpose. One intriguing hypothesis is that these skulls were deliberately collected, and possibly even used as headhunting trophies, by early modern humans arriving in the region. The idea of interspecies conflict on Java during this period is supported by several lines of evidence. First, the timing of the Solo Skull's deposition overlaps with the proposed early migration of Homo sapiens into Southeast Asia. The warm and stable climate of the Eemian interglacial would have facilitated the movement of human populations along coastal routes, with Java becoming a key destination due to its rich resources and strategic location. Genetic studies also reveal hints of ancient admixture events between Homo sapiens and archaic populations, but they also leave open the possibility of more violent encounters. The arrival of early Homo sapiens in Java could have posed an existential threat to the local Homo erectus population, resulting in territorial disputes and perhaps outright warfare. In 1951, paleoanthropologists noticed major traumatic injuries in skulls 4 and 6, which they believed were caused by a cutting tool and blunt instrument, respectively. They show signs of inflammation and healing, indicating that the individuals likely survived the altercation. Archaeologists also discovered only the skull caps, not the teeth, which is extremely unusual, but teeth are often removed when used as trophies. So, they interpreted skulls 4 and 6 as victims of an unsuccessful assault, and the other skulls with the base broken out as the result of more successful attempts to slay the victims, assuming this was done by other humans to access and consume the brain. They were unsure if this was done by a neighbouring tribe, or by, quote, more advanced human beings who would have given evidence of their superior culture by slaying their more primitive fellow man. It was proposed that only skull caps exist because Solo Man was modifying skulls into skull cups, but other investigators were sceptical, citing the jagged rims of skulls 1, 5 and 10 as being unsuitable for this. Cannibalism and ritual headhunting have been proposed based on the absence of any other remains besides the skull cap. This was reinforced by the historical practice of headhunting and cannibalism among some modern Indonesian, Australian and Polynesian groups until recently. The Solo River site itself offers compelling evidence for such a scenario. The skulls exhibit patterns of damage that some researchers interpret as post-mortem modification, possibly indicative of ritualistic behaviour. Cut marks and fractures on the crania suggest deliberate defleshing or processing, practices consistent with headhunting or trophy collection. While alternative explanations, such as natural processes or predator activity, cannot be entirely ruled out, the arrangement and treatment of the skulls imply a human hand. If early Homo sapiens were indeed responsible for these modifications, it raises the tantalizing possibility that they viewed these encounters with Homo erectus as not merely competitive, but deeply symbolic. 
Perhaps the horde was taken by surprise and fled. Perhaps the skulls were put down to mark off the area. It seems that even today, various tribes in New Guinea demarcate their dwelling or hunting grounds in a similar manner. They evidently suppose that the spirit dwelling in the skull can help them to defend a particular area against invaders. Many later researchers agree with the interpretation of the site. The Solo people were the victims of cannibalism. One archaeologist wrote, A vast number of different bones of all the animal types were unearthed, but of human remains only a very particular selection whose incidents were certainly not natural. All of the skulls had their faces smashed, and all but two had the bottom of the skulls broken open. Early researchers called them skull trophies and likened them to the practice of modern headhunters who eat the brains to acquire the wisdom and skill of the defeated foe. The skulls were placed by the river to mark the area. It seems that even today various tribes in New Guinea demarcate their dwelling or hunting grounds in a similar manner. They evidently suppose that the spirit dwelling in the skull can help them defend a particular area against invaders. One archaeologist right back in the 1930s, if the solo skulls were indeed collected as part of a ritual or commemorative practice, it would mark an important step in the cultural evolution of Homo sapiens, showcasing their ability to imbue objects and actions with meaning. Such practices may also have served to reinforce group identity and cohesion in the face of external threats, whether from other human populations or environmental challenges. Comparing the Omo II skull with the Solo skulls further underscores the potential for conflict and interaction. Omo II's cranial shape, with its higher vault and less robust features, reflects the evolutionary trajectory toward modern human morphology. In contrast, the Solo skulls retain the hallmark traits of more archaic humans, including thick brow ridges, low cranial vaults and robust bone structure. These differences likely extended beyond physical appearance to behavioural and cognitive traits, potentially fueling tensions between the two groups. Early Homo sapiens, with their advanced tool-making skills and social organisation, would have held significant advantages in such encounters, but they may also have been influenced by the archaic populations they met, adopting or adapting certain practices. The implications of these interactions go beyond mere conflict. The use of skulls as trophies or ritual objects suggests that early Homo sapiens in Java had developed complex symbolic behaviour. This aligns with evidence from other regions such as Africa and the Levant, where early humans engaged in burial practices, art and symbolic use of objects. Indeed, both ritual cannibalism and the practices of headhunters are rooted in magic and religion and are signs of man's spiritual awakening, even though their precise significance is hard to establish. The human skulls on the Solo River must have been left behind, either intentionally or unintentionally. The broader context of an out-of-Africa migration during the Eemian adds weight to this interpretation. Recent genetic studies have identified traces of early modern human DNA in Southeast Asian populations, suggesting multiple waves of migration and interaction. These findings challenge the traditional model of a single late dispersal and point to a more complex narrative of human expansion. The story of the Omo II and Solo skulls exemplifies this dynamic interplay of migration, interaction and adaptation. The similarities between the skulls, despite their geographical and temporal distance, highlight the shared challenges faced by human populations during this pivotal period. Both Omo II and the Solo skulls bear witness to the resilience of the human lineage, reflecting the gradual emergence of traits that define us today. At the same time, they underscore the profound impact of environmental and cultural factors on the course of evolution, shaping the destiny of species and populations. The possibility of interspecies conflict on Java, with its echoes of headhunting and ritual violence, offers a stark reminder of the complexities of human history. It challenges us to reconsider the narratives of progress and cooperation that often dominate discussions of early Homo sapiens. Instead, it suggests a more nuanced view, one in which competition, conflict and cultural innovation coexisted, driving the development of human societies in all their complexity. As researchers continue to uncover new evidence and refine their interpretations, 
the Omo II and Solo skulls will remain central to our understanding of this critical chapter in the story of humanity. The findings further underline the shift in thinking this field of study has undergone over the decades. We used to think of human evolution as a progression, with a straight line leading from apes to us. This is embodied in the so-called March of Progress illustration, where a stooping, chimp-like creature gradually morphs into Homo sapiens, apparently the apex of evolution. These days we know things were far messier. The latest discoveries highlight a mind-boggling truth, that many of the species we thought of as transitional stages in this onward march overlapped with each other, in some cases for hundreds of thousands of years. Thanks for watching and please let us know in the comments what you think. Were these skulls part of the same population, examples of convergent evolution or the product of gene flow between Africa and Asia?